right now it's uh, it's it's quite substantial. Um, and there's different ways you can measure the technological gap. The, the design of the chip is one. The uh, depth of the software ecosystem. Talking about that technological gap and high barriers, some argue that high barriers, I mean, consolidate power among existing leaders like NVIDIA and TSMC. How do you see those impacts on the barriers of these companies? Well, I think both of those companies share uh, several um, uh, dynamics which explain the barriers that they've uh, seen around them. One is uh, an extraordinary demand to produce technological improvements every single year, uh, which means that technology is not stagnant. It's racing forward very rapidly and creating a, a lot of difficulty for competitors in trying to catch up. The second is their market positioning. If you take, for example, Taiwan's TSMC, because it's at the center of the industry, it's the most commonly used foundry to manufacture semiconductors. The rest of the industry positions its technology with reference to TSMC. Mm -hmm. Software tools are designed to make sure that they're compatible with TSMC. Intellectual property is designed with similar concerns in mind. The manufacturers of machine tools must make sure their machines will work with TSMC because it's often their largest customer. And so it's, it's not only the fact that TSMC is racing forward technologically every single year, that's certainly important. It's also that because of TSMC's central position, the rest of the ecosystem is defining its technological advances around it. And that has been a second factor that's made uh, TSMC's market position so durable over time. Yes. I mean, talking about TSMC, I think we have to talk about NVIDIA as well. So it's almost difficult to discuss chip industry this year without mentioning NVIDIA. I mean, their dominant position in GPU has undoubtedly driven much of their growth. However, whether um, NVIDIA's almost monopolistic power will persist or face challenges from the other potential competitor could be a critical question. Will they keep their crown or will they be challenged by any rising competitor? What's your thought on that? Well, it's, it's impossible to exclude the, the possibility of disruptive innovation, especially in an industry that moves as rapidly as this one. But I think NVIDIA has benefited in the past from some of the similar dynamics of yeah. TSFC. For example, if you look at the R&D intensivity of the types of uh, products that NVIDIA uh, designs, they've got to produce new and better chips every single year. And so the fact that they're the largest producer of GPUs uh, gives them a real advantage against competitors in terms of designing and then deploying better chips. The second dynamic is that just like TSMC has the rest of the chip ecosystem designed around it, the same is true for NVIDIA. Because it's at the center of the AI world, AI software tools are designed to work well with NVIDIA's system. NVIDIA has a um, a, a software layer called CUDA around it that other types of software tools are built on top of. And if you're going to build something in the AI space, you've got to make sure that you're CUDA compatible. And that's been a, a second factor that has uh, made NVIDIA um, such a, a strong and given it such a durable market position because there are real costs if you want to switch out of NVIDIA's ecosystem towards somebody else's. You've got much less software compatibility around it. And so that first mover advantage, which was so important for TSMC, is also part of what explains NVIDIA's position too. I mean, then, like, what are your thoughts whether AMD could catch up NVIDIA competitiveness and become, like, next NVIDIA? Well, I think the, the challenge that AMD faces is exactly in the software that we were discussing. Mm. In terms of the chip design, one can argue whose chip is better, NVIDIA's or AMD's. But that's not the only thing that matters. Software combati compatibility is hugely important. And that's where what we've seen is that there's uh, a, a very high level of desire to continue using similar chips so that you don't have any software compatibility issues. And that will, I think, uh, give NVIDIA a very strong advantage uh, going forward. So then how significant do you perceive the technological gap between NVIDIA and other companies? Like well, right now it's, uh, it's, it's quite substantial. Um, mm -hmm. And there's different ways you can measure the technological gap. The, the design of the chip is one, the uh, depth of the software ecosystem that is another. Um, but certainly there's no one that comes close to NVIDIA in terms of its centrality in the artificial intelligence training landscape. 
NVIDIA is far ahead of its competitors, both uh, AMD and also Google, which designs its own in-house TPUs. They're both trying to catch up mm -hmm. uh, to NVIDIA, but at this point, NVIDIA is the clear leader. Mm. Wow. So, and maybe, is there any other company that has this powerful presence in the semiconductor value chain like NVIDIA or TSMC? Well, the other example that's often cited is ASML, the Dutch company that produces mm -hmm. extreme ultraviolet photolithography tools, an extraordinarily complex tool that's critical for the efficient manufacturing of high-end chips. ASML is actually the world's only producer of these tools. They produce 100% of the world market, uh, and that makes them an absolutely irreplaceable player in the world chip-making process. Mm. So then, how do you assess the competitiveness of the Korean companies within the industry? Well, I think Korean companies are, are quite important, especially in the sphere of manufacturing memory chips, which is where Korean companies have primarily focused over the past several decades. You see this uh, both in terms of the market share of uh, Samsung and SK Hynix, the two biggest producers in Korea, and also in terms of the the production of high bandwidth memory, a new type of memory chip that's critical for artificial intelligence applications, where South Korea's SK Hynix was the first large-scale producer. Okay, to, so to sum up, considering the dominant market nature of these companies we're mentioning now, do you think I could say it's highly unlikely that their dominant power will be easily challenged by other companies in the near future? Will it be okay for me to like phrase it that way? Well, it certainly won't be easily challenged, and the, the history of the chip industry mm -hmm. uh, does suggest that many of the barriers to entry that we've discussed are only growing with time. Mm. Well, that was a very compelling insight into the dynamics of semiconductor market. So last but not least, since having a chance to have a conversation with someone like you is an extremely rare opportunity, um, I have to ask you this question. So ACTF here, that's our ETF um, branding. We have produced AI, I mean, we have produced, um, introduced ACE Global Semiconductor Top 4 Plus ETF about one and a half years ago, which heavily invests around 80% of its access to the top four players of the com uh, in the market. So I know this may not be your expertise field, but I'm a bit curious about your thoughts on our investment strategies. Well, what are the, the top four companies that you invest in? <laughs> Sorry, I was just too eager to ask you the question. So just to give you a little bit of detail. So we designed to um, concentrate investment in each top ranked company within the specific semiconductor sector. So um, NVIDIA for number one in system chips, Samsung number one in memory chips, TSMC number one foundry, and ASML in um, the semiconductor equipment company. And um, the baseline idea when we designed our product was to ensure that that we could best capture the growth opportunities in the chip industry by focusing on the top players as we have discussed within the few minutes and also enjoy like the growth in the whole ecosystem. For instance, as you mentioned, increased demand in NVIDIA chips will lead to expand um, the chip production in TSMC, which also could drive up the demand for Samsung. And then a similar benefit will flow to ASML. So that was like the whole flow of the investment scheme idea. So with this detail, more details, um, how do you think about our investment strategies or any thoughts? Well, it, it sounds like the, the strategy meshes well with the mm -hmm. high barriers to entry that, that we discussed and the, the structural growth and demand uh, for semiconductors overall. Uh, really? Do you, do you think you could put your own money into something strategy like this? <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, certainly the, uh, these, these are all companies that uh, play a central role in the chip industry. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you, Chris. I mean, thank you so much for your time. I know it's late in the night. All right, thank all right. you. Bye. Thank you. 많은 대화를 나누어 보았는데 어떠셨을까요? 이번 기회를 통해서 좀 깊이 있는 인사이트를 얻을 수 있는 그런 귀중한 시간이 되셨기를 희망합니다. 현재 국내 ETF 시장에는 굉장히 다양한 반도체 ETF가 있지만 최근 반도체 시장 트렌드를 가장 잘 반영하고 반도체 산업의 성장 수혜를 함께 누릴 수 있는 종목들로 구성되었는지 여부가 바로 수익률의 결과로 이어지고 있습니다. 
어, 앞서 밀러 교수님과 말씀을 나누어 보았듯이 에이스 글로벌 반도체 타코 플러스가 어, 글로벌 반도체 시장의 흐름을 가장 잘 반영하고 있는 어떤 ETF 투자 솔루션이라 저희는 확신을 하며 마무리를 할까 합니다. 앞으로도 저희 에이스 ETF는 적어도 10년 이상은 지속될 수 있는 장기 성장 테마를 발굴해서 시장과 투자자 여러분들은 물론 대한민국 자본시장에 의미가 있는 ETF나 금융 상품을 소개해 드릴 수 있도록 최선을 다하겠습니다. 감사합니다. ACE ETF